I am Pastor Kolo, the man who transmits the anointing directly. Let me pray for you. Close your eyes and don't say anything. My Bangala is already anointed, and I will use it to transmit the anointing into you. If you want to have children, you need the anointing. Let me put it inside you. This is how Pastor Kolo continued from one woman to another until the last girl who stole his manhood. Follow closely to the end and please subscribe for more stories as well. In an African village lived a man named Kolo. Kolo was no ordinary man. With his natural charisma and eloquence, he captivated crowds and left a lasting impression on everyone he met. But Kolo had a dream bigger than just being an influential man, he wanted to be revered, respected, and feared. So, he decided to become a pastor and start his own church. Kolo began by observing the practices of local pastors and healers. He memorized Bible verses, developed a powerful voice for his sermons, and perfected his ability to read people's emotions. He was particularly interested in the village women, knowing that their devotion to faith could be a powerful tool for manipulation. One Sunday morning, he appeared in the village square and began preaching in a powerful and emotional voice. My brothers and sisters, he cried, the Lord spoke to me last night. He told me this village needs light, healing, and miracles. He has chosen me to be his servant among you, to bring his blessing and power into your lives. Come to me, and I will show you the way to deliverance and prosperity. Intrigued by this sudden appearance, the villagers began to gather around Kolo. His words resonated with a magnetic force, captivating everyone's attention. Murmurs of curiosity and wonder spread through the crowd, and soon the whole village was gathered to listen to this mysterious man. Kolo continued his speech, telling stories of miracles he had supposedly performed in other villages. He spoke of healed illnesses, exorcised demons, saved marriages, and barren women who had given birth due to his prayers. His stories were so convincing that even the most skeptical began to believe in his power. To reinforce his image, Kolo decided to organize a large healing ceremony the following weekend. He chose a large field on the outskirts of the village and asked the villagers to come with their sick, their problems, and their worries. In the days leading up to the ceremony, he walked through the village, meeting people and listening to their stories with faint attention, noting information that would be useful later. On the day of the ceremony, the field was filled with villagers eager to see the promised miracles. A rudimentary stage had been set up, and Kolo stood on it, surrounded by a few assistants he had recruited from among the village's young men. He began by singing hymns, urging the crowd to join in, creating an electric atmosphere of devotion and anticipation. He then called the sick to the stage one by one. The first was an old man bent by age and illness. Kolo placed his hands on him, praying fervently, calling on the Holy Spirit to descend and heal the man. After a few minutes of intense prayer, the old man miraculously straightened up, claiming he felt stronger and healthier. The crowd erupted in applause, convinced that a real miracle had just occurred. Encouraged by this success, Kolo continued with other sick people, repeating the same procedure. Each apparent healing reinforced his reputation and attracted more and more followers. The women, in particular, were impressed by his charisma and supposed divine connection. They began to see him not only as a spiritual guide but also as a solution to their most intimate and personal problems. Gradually, Kolo began to introduce more personal and private rituals. He organized individual prayer sessions with the village women, telling them they needed special spiritual care to solve their marital, fertility, and health problems. These sessions were often tinged with symbolic gestures, such as anointing with oil, intense prayers, and sometimes physical contact under the pretense of transmitting divine power. 
One day, a woman named Ekosua, known for her fertility problems, came to him in tears. She told him she had tried everything to conceive a child without success. Kolo looked into her eyes with a soft but authoritative voice and said, My daughter, the Lord has revealed to me that your deliverance requires a special prayer, a prayer that demands sacrifice and unwavering faith. You must follow my instructions without question, and I promise your womb will be blessed. Desperate and willing to do anything to achieve her dream of motherhood, Akosua agreed without hesitation. Kolo then explained the special ritual she had to follow, a ritual that involved a spiritual union with him under the pretense of transmitting the necessary divine energy for her healing. This was the beginning of Kolo's secret practices. He managed to convince several women that their problems required special prayers involving intimate acts. These women, blinded by their faith and despair, submitted to his demands, believing they were receiving divine blessings. Over time, Kolo refined his manipulation techniques. He began asking the women to shave their pubic hair during public ceremonies, pretending that this symbolized purification and rebirth. The women, though embarrassed, accepted these rituals, thinking they were part of the path to their deliverance. Kolo quickly became a central figure in the village. His church attracted more and more followers every Sunday. The songs and sermons resonated in the air, creating an atmosphere of fervor and hope. Donations and offerings poured in, enriching Kolo and allowing him to live a relatively luxurious life compared to other villages. However, behind this facade of piety and miracles, Kolo continued to exploit the village women. His power over them was total, and he used their ignorance to fulfill his desires. He knew that as long as he could convince them that their suffering was part of a grand divine plan, they would continue to follow him blindly. He firmly believed that his charisma and supposed divine connection put him above social rules and norms. One Sunday, after a particularly fiery sermon on purification and sanctification, Kolo announced to the assembly that he had received a new divine revelation. The Lord, according to him, had shown him a way to purify the village women, to free them from their marital and fertility problems through a sacred ritual. This ritual, he explained, required them to shave their pubic hair in public, symbolizing their purification and spiritual renewal. The villagers, though shocked by the nature of this revelation, did not question Kolo's authority. His charisma and power were such that they accepted his words as divine truths. The women, desperate to find a solution to their problems, submitted to his demands, believing it would bring them closer to the deliverance they sought. The first shaving ritual was organized a week later during a large public ceremony. Kolo had asked his assistants to prepare a stage at the center of the altar where the women would stand in line, ready to be purified. The women stood on stage one by one while Kolo stood beside them, urging them to have faith in this purification process. With solemn gestures and fervent prayers, he began shaving the women's pubic hair, proclaiming that each razor stroke drove away evil spirits and the curses that plagued them. The scene, though shocking, was imbued with an atmosphere of devotion and mysticism. However, as these rituals continued, the promised beneficial effects of Kolo were slow to manifest. In fact, for many women, their marital and fertility problems worsened. They were confused and disconcerted, but Kolo always had an explanation. He told them that these sufferings were part of the purification process, that they had to persevere in their faith, and that their deliverance would come in due time. Meanwhile, Kolo continued his special prayers with some women, convincing them that they required a spiritual union with him for their problems to be permanently resolved. I need to anoint your machine, he explained. I need to put the anointing on my bangala and transmit it directly into yours. 
These special prayers involved sexual relations that Kolo described as a necessary transfer of divine energy. He carefully chose his targets, ensuring they were desperate and devoted enough to submit to his demands without question. One of these women was a Joa, a young woman married for five years without children. She had tried everything, potions, traditional healers, consultations with doctors in the neighboring town, and incessant prayers. Nothing had worked. When Kolo spoke to her about the special prayer, she was willing to try anything. He invited her to come to his home for a private session. When Ajo arrived at Kolo's house, she was nervous but full of hope. Kolo received her with deceptive warmth, speaking to her with sweet and reassuring words. He made her sit down and began with a long and passionate prayer, invoking the Holy Spirit and asking for divine intervention to solve her problems. Then he explained to her that for the prayer to be effective, she had to submit to a ritual of anointing and spiritual union. Ajoa, though hesitant, accepted. She believed that Pastor Kolo was a man of God and that refusing his request would be like rejecting a divine blessing. This marked the beginning of a series of encounters where Kolo exploited her faith and desperation to fulfill his own desires. Rumors of these special prayers began to spread in the village, but few dared to speak openly. The women who had undergone these rituals felt ashamed and guilty, fearing they would be judged or ridiculed if they revealed the truth. Kolo, meanwhile, continued to manipulate his followers, using their faith as a shield against any form of criticism or rebellion. However, some began to murmur. The village elders, who observed the events with skepticism, started asking questions. They had seen pastors and healers come and go, but none had used such methods. They decided to watch Kolo more closely, looking for signs of his true nature. Despite his confidence, cracks began to appear in his empire of deceit. The women he had exploited were becoming increasingly desperate and frustrated by the lack of results. Some began to talk among themselves, sharing their experiences and realizing they had been duped. Their stories spread, and soon a wave of suspicion and discontent began to form in the village. Kolo felt the walls closing in on him and knew he needed to find a way to restore his authority and dispel the doubts forming around him. He decided to double down on his sermons and rituals, hoping that even more spectacular demonstrations of miracles and healings would convince his followers of his power. Despite the rituals and special prayers, the condition of the village women only worsened. Rumors of these scandalous practices began to spread, and a wave of discontent and suspicion settled among the villagers. The elders, initially skeptical of Kolo, became increasingly concerned about his growing influence and questionable methods. One day, Amma, a woman who had participated in Kolo's ritual, went to see the elders. She was desperate and in tears, explaining how her fertility problems had worsened after following Kolo's instructions. She felt betrayed and used, and her testimony triggered a chain reaction. Other women, inspired by Oma's courage, began to come forward, sharing their own stories of manipulation and deception. The elders decided to hold an emergency meeting to discuss the situation. They were aware that Kolo had considerable influence over much of the population, but they could not ignore the growing testimonies of discontent and suffering. At this meeting, they decided to monitor Kolo more closely and investigate his practices. Meanwhile, Kolo continued preaching and organizing ceremonies, ignoring the murmurs of discontent spreading through the village. He firmly believed that his charisma and spiritual authority were enough to maintain his control. However, he could not ignore the growing signs of defiance among his followers. One evening, as he returned home after a long day of preaching and ritual, he noticed a small group of women gathered around Oma's house. Intrigued, he discreetly approached to listen to their conversation. What he heard made him shudder. 
The women were talking about their experiences with him, sharing their suffering, and expressing their anger and disillusionment. Kolo realized that his position was more precarious than he had imagined. He decided to take measures to strengthen his authority and restore the faith of his followers. The following Sunday, he preached with renewed fervor, speaking of persecution and tests of faith. He accused his detractors of sowing division and confusion and urged his followers to remain steadfast in their belief in his divine powers. Despite his efforts, the tension continued to rise. The elders, determined to put an end to Kolo's abuses, began to collect testimonies and evidence of his practices. They discreetly interviewed the women who had participated in the rituals, documenting their stories and looking for inconsistencies in Kolo's statements. One day, the elders called a general village assembly to discuss their findings. They invited Kolo to attend and confront his practices directly before the community. Kolo, though nervous, accepted the invitation, believing he could easily defuse the situation with his usual charisma. At the assembly, the elders presented the testimonies of the women, revealing the true nature of Kolo's special prayers. The crowd, shocked and outraged, listened in silence. Kolo tried to defend himself, claiming that his actions were guided by divine revelations and that the women's sufferings were part of a spiritual purification process. However, the women's testimonies were too convincing to ignore. The crowd began to murmur, expressing their anger and disappointment. The elders, seeing their strategy working, intensified their attack, asking direct questions to Kolo and demanding clear explanations. Cornered, Kolo began to lose his composure. His charisma and authority crumbled under the pressure of the overwhelming evidence. Finally, a woman named Essie, one of the first to have participated in the ritual, stood up and spoke. Pastor Kolo, she said with a trembling but resolute voice, you promised us miracles and blessings, but all we received in return were sufferings and disillusionments. We believed in you, but you betrayed us. Today, we demand the truth. Essie's words resonated throughout the assembly, causing a wave of shock among the villagers. Kolo, unmasked and defenseless, tried one last time to justify himself, but it was too late. The villagers' trust was broken, and his spiritual authority had collapsed. Despite the public confrontation, Kolo did not give up his methods. He understood that if he wanted to maintain his hold on his followers, he had to find a new approach to reinforce his position. He decided to focus on even more spectacular miracles and more intense rituals to reaffirm his supposed divine connection. Shortly after the assembly, Kolo announced a new purification ceremony that would surpass all previous ones. He promised visible miracles and instant healings, hoping to regain his followers' trust. The entire village awaited this event with a mix of skepticism and hope. On the day of the ceremony, Kolo deployed all his shamanic talents. He organized a grand procession with songs, dances, and spiritual invocations. He chose several women among the most desperate in the village to participate in public purification rituals, promising that their problems would be resolved in a spectacular manner. One of the women was Mawuvi, a young woman who had suffered from many health problems for years. Kolo brought her on stage, proclaiming that she would be the living testimony of divine power. He began praying with feverish intensity, calling on the Holy Spirit to descend and heal Mawuvi before the entire assembly. However, as the ceremony reached its climax, something unexpected happened. Instead of showing signs of healing, Mawuvi suddenly collapsed on stage, seized by violent convulsions. The crowd, panicked, stepped back while Kolo, bewildered, tried to maintain his calm. The elders, who had observed the scene with skepticism, saw this as further proof of Kolo's imposture. 
The murmurs of discontent turned into cries of anger. The crowd, now convinced of Kolo's deception, began to turn against him. The elders spoke up, calling on the villagers to remain calm and think about the best way to handle the situation. Kolo, seeing the situation slipping away, tried to slip away quietly, but the angry crowd surrounded him, demanding explanations and accountability. He realized that his only option was to flee the village before things got worse. He managed to escape in the confusion, leaving behind a divided and angry community. The villagers, under the elders' leadership, began to take steps to undo Kolo's rituals and heal the spiritual wounds he had inflicted. They organized traditional purification ceremonies, seeking to restore harmony and peace in their community. After fleeing the village, Kolo wandered from village to village, trying to rebuild his reputation and recreate his empire of deceit. However, news of his scandalous practices spread quickly, and he found it increasingly difficult to gain people's trust. His life became a perpetual flight, without stability or support. One day, Kolo arrived in a coastal village where he decided to try a new approach to regain his followers' trust. He presented himself as a humble servant of God, offering prayers and blessings for modest donations. He hoped to rebuild a base of followers before reverting to his old methods. In this village, he met Afi, a beautiful and mysterious young woman who seemed to suffer from spiritual problems and was seeking a husband. Kolo saw an opportunity to prove his power and restore his reputation. He offered to help her, promising miraculous healing. Afi accepted, apparently impressed by his words and promises. However, Afi was not an ordinary woman. She was a mermaid and a witch, come to punish Kolo for his crimes against women. During their first private meeting, Kolo felt a strange aura around Effie, but he ignored it, thinking it was simply a sign of her spiritual suffering. During their prayer session, Effie appeared receptive and submissive, perfectly playing the role of a desperate woman seeking deliverance. Kolo, blinded by his arrogance and desire for public redemption, suspected nothing. He believed that this spectacular healing would restore his reputation and power. One evening, during what he believed to be their final prayer session, Kolo decided to proceed with a special prayer. He explained to Afi that a spiritual union with him was necessary for her complete healing. Afi accepted without hesitation, an enigmatic smile on her lips. However, when Kolo attempted to initiate the special prayer, he felt a sharp pain. Effie suddenly transformed, revealing her true nature as a mermaid and witch. Before he could react, she tore off his penis, condemning him to a life of pain and shame. Kolo screamed in terror and pain, realizing too late that he had been outwitted. Effie disappeared as mysteriously as she had appeared, leaving him bleeding and disfigured. The village, alerted by Kolo's cries, discovered him in this pitiful state. Shocked by the sight and the story he told, they understood that they had been dealing with a charlatan. The news of Kolo's downfall spread quickly, and he became a cautionary tale in the region, a symbol of the consequences of spiritual manipulation and deception. His name was remembered with contempt and fear, serving as a warning to those who would dare use faith to exploit the vulnerable. Kolo, now a shadow of his former self, wandered aimlessly, haunted by the ghosts of his victims and the memory of his own downfall. The village, meanwhile, began to heal from his influence, rediscovering its traditional spiritual practices and restoring the community's harmony. The elders, having learned from this painful experience, reinforced their vigilance and ensured that no other charlatan would ever gain such influence in their village again. The women, particularly those who had suffered at the hands of Kolo, found solace in their unity and resilience, forming a support network to protect themselves and future generations from similar exploitation.